When you've got a library of over a thousand titles that you're reviewing, that's going to cover a lot of different genres of video games, with some being more popular and plentiful than others. Over the last five years, I have reviewed tons of different racing games, sports games, arcade action titles, puzzle games, and I've even found time to review a few role-playing games, other than a certain notable exception that keeps eluding me. Look, it's getting reviewed this year, I swear. I just happen to get stuck on the Biosystems Lab, leave me alone. Anyway, one of the genres that oftentimes gets overlooked on these consoles, sometimes for good reason, is the combat simulation. There's actually a few different combat simulation titles on the Genesis, and so far I've looked at two different ones from Electronic Arts, in F-22 Interceptor and LHX Attack Chopper back in episodes 86 and 187 in case you're curious about how those went. But to sum up, I actually enjoyed both of them a lot more than I was expecting. However, I wasn't expecting to like either of them at all, so it wasn't exactly a high bar to get over. Today, though, I thought I'd step outside that Electronic Arts comfort zone and review a combat sim from a company that I certainly wasn't expecting it from in Domark with MiG-29 Fighter Pilot. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, for those of you out there that don't know me and just randomly dropped here by the algorithm due to searching for antiquated Soviet airframes, hey, I'm not judging, everyone needs a hobby, my name is Dave, and welcome to Zalgamoto, the channel where I'm out to collect and review not just video games that inexplicably make those red commie bastards the star of the show, but also the nearly 1,280 other titles released in the English language for the Sega Master System, Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega or Mega CD as the case may be, and finally the 32X. Basically, if I can plug it into a Genesis either by itself or with some sort of add-on and be able to read what's on the screen, I'm trying to get a copy of it and review it for posterity with both looks at the original packaging and gameplay captured from original hardware whenever possible. Now, obviously that commie line was a joke, but what has always gotten my attention about this game is the fact that it's named for what we would consider in the free world an enemy aircraft. And yes, I know that by August of 1993, when the game was released in North America, that the Soviet Union had been dissolved for about two years. But as a child of the 80s and plenty of MacGyver reruns, that specter is just always going to be there. And I suppose that in other genres of video games, it's not that uncommon to have a game where you're either playing as a bad guy directly, or that you can make choices that take you down a dark path. Something like a Mass Effect, Knights of the Old Republic, or Fable. But playing as a real-life enemy aircraft? I don't know, that just, it feels strange. Hell, the entire plot of the original Top Gun revolved around F-14 Tomcats fighting against the fictional brother to the MiG-29, the MiG-28. And before you ask, no, I have no idea why they chose a fictional plane for that, unless it was just some sort of licensing issue with Miko Yan and Gurevich Design Bureau, aka the MiG and MiG-29. Taking any kind of preconceived notions out of things, what are we left with? Well, MiG-29 Fighter Pilot is technically a follow-up to MiG-29 Fulcrum and Super Fulcrum, which were originally released for home computers in 1991. So I think the question is, does MiG-29 Fighter Pilot hold up to those original games? And are any of these games any good, or should players stick to combat sims that have more of a western nature? Well, we shall see, but first a look at the package. And this is my copy of MiG-29 Fighter Pilot for the Genesis. This particular copy is in decent shape, at least on the outside, with the outer cover fully intact, minus the hang tab at the top. The rest of the outer cover is free from any scuffing, scratches, or tears. The inner cover is perfectly intact as well, with no edge wear, sun bleaching, or water damage. The manual is a little bent, as we'll see in a minute, but it's good enough for me to want to hold on to this particular copy. However, if I did want to seek out another one, perhaps with an intact hang tab, they're currently going for about $15 on price charting. This is one of those that, while it's not exactly a common title, it's clearly not in high demand either, so that may not be a good sign. As far as the front cover goes, well, I don't think that art is doing the title any favors. It's not bad specifically, and I do like the nice touch of the pilot's visor essentially being see-through in an attempt to show it being reflective. But other than that, it's just pretty plain, with some random coloring that I guess is supposed to look like the evening sky, 
and a picture of the namesake jet off to the side, but not really showing the jet as much as it's showing off the missiles that are strapped to the bottom. The logo isn't exactly enticing either, and it's off-center due to Domark needing to advertise that it's not just an 8 meg title, but a super 8 meg title up in the corner, which honestly would be a lot more impressive if it was 1990 instead of 1993, as 8 meg titles had been around since Strider first hit the market in November of that year. The Japanese and European covers of the game are relatively similar, but I think the Japanese version takes it, as there's no extraneous advertising of the size of the cartridge, and the logo is properly centered. Also, if you're wondering why the Japanese version references Tengen instead of Domark, well, that's because Domark and Tengen had a licensing publishing agreement, and for this game, Domark took care of everything in Europe and retained publishing in the United States, but then had Tengen actually distribute the game for them in the United States, and then via that agreement, allowed Tengen to take care of everything in Japan. This is something that I'm sure absolutely no one cares about in 2024, but I still find it interesting and part of the game's history. Flipping over the back, and yeah, this looks like a Tengen release with that stark white background, however, they have mixed it up a little bit and have the four screenshots going in a column straight down the middle. And they're all of decent quality, with some variety between the pictures. The flavor text throughout is actually pretty solid, and does a good job of hyping up the game. And I do like the header, The Cold War's Over, Now the Hottest Soviet Jet Fighter is Yours to Command. I could totally see that being used in a magazine advertisement for the game around that time. Opening up the box, and as mentioned, the manual's cover is a little bit bent up, but the rest of the manual is fully intact. It's not nearly as thick as some of the manuals that I tend to see with combat sims, which tend to resemble actual operation manuals for the vehicles, but what's actually included is definitely enough to get you up and running with the game, and I especially like the center layout that gives a full rundown of your instrument panel so you can get quickly acclimated to where everything is that you need to be familiar with. There's also explanations of each of the five missions in the game, so you have some semblance of an idea as to why you're actually blowing things up, and a full control breakdown for both the three and six button controllers, which definitely makes things easier to get up and running. Okay, that's the package. Let's fly off into that wild blue yonder and terrorize some unsuspecting fictional Middle Eastern country that's in no way related to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. You ever go to play a game and you just know immediately that there's going to be a problem? And I don't mean in the sense that you're given a game and just based on its name or its reputation or even the genre, that chances are you aren't going to like it. Let's say, for instance, someone picks a game out at random for you to play. What's the earliest that you might know that there's going to be a problem, aside from the game refusing to boot up for some sort of technical problem? Well, if you are paying attention to the thumbnail for this review, you might already know what I'm going to bring up, but for those of you that didn't notice it, the title screen is wrong. Or maybe it's right and the game's name is incorrect, but clearly the developers of the game and the people at Domark and Tengen were not on the same page. Maybe you at least caught the part towards the end of the intro where I said MiG-29 Fighter Pilot is technically a follow-up to MiG-29 Fulcrum and Super Fulcrum. Although, if the title screen is to be believed, MiG-29 Fighter Pilot is MiG-29 Fulcrum, or at least it thinks it is. Now, I don't know about you, but when a game can't even get its name correct, I tend to worry about what else might be wrong beneath the surface. And just to be clear, while the game I'm calling MiG-29 Fighter Pilot is definitely similar to MiG-29 Fulcrum, in that they're both centered around the same jet and use a similar display, the actual missions and content to the games are different, so it does make more sense to have a different name. Regardless of all that, I'm not sure how you screw up a title screen, but it's simply first on the list of problems. Once you get into the game, you have three choices. You can either undertake the training mission, go after the first mission in the game, Operation Red Witch, or enter a password that opens up access to the remaining four missions in the game. Yes, you heard me correctly, the game only has five real missions to complete, 
each with a various color as part of their name. Now, that might not necessarily bring up a red flag for you, but I'll point you back to the cover of the game, where it was advertising Super 8 Meg. Having only five missions doesn't exactly jive with a game that's trying to get itself across as being a big game, especially when in comparison to the other two combat sims that I've played so far on the channel, F-22 Interceptor and LHX Attack Chopper. With LHX Attack Chopper having 30 missions and F-22 Interceptor having over 100. It's not a good look, to say the least, and it's definitely difficult to argue in defense of MiG-29 Fighter Pilot, considering that LHX Attack Chopper came out almost a year before, and F-22 Interceptor came out almost two years before, and was two MiG smaller to boot. And before the well actually start, yes, I know some of the missions in F-22 Interceptor are very short, when you add it all up, it's still significantly more content. Before I go too much further, I will say one nice thing about the game, and that is the fact that I appreciate the inclusion of the training mission and how it's implemented. Assuming you know nothing about the game, the training mission goes a long way to helping new players get started, as it basically takes you step by step throughout a mission, complete with a nice on-screen guide that shows you what button to press on the controller and when. And this isn't simply a matter of what button to press to shoot or anything like that, it takes you through the entire takeoff process and a few of the different map and informational screens that you will be using during real gameplay. You will definitely still want to have the manual to explain some of the minutiae like which missiles are which and what all of the gauges and HUD items represent, but the training mission does go a long way to easing the learning curve, especially if you haven't played a combat sim before. One other nice thing about the training mission is that it helped to point out an odd controller incompatibility before I had the opportunity to get frustrated. I mentioned in the box section that this was a late enough release to support both 3 and 6 button controllers, and you definitely are going to want to be able to use the 6 button control method if it's available to you. For reasons that I'll get to later on. I've mentioned this in previous reviews, but for about 95% of the games that I review on the channel, for every console, I tend to use one of two controllers, either a RetroBit wireless 6 button controller or the 8-bit Doe M30. Both controllers are great, but they also each work a little differently, and due to that, MiG-29 Fighter Pilot doesn't detect the RetroBit controller as a 6 button controller just as a 3 button and the training mission conveniently shows that on the screen so you can tell what's going on. As mentioned, I strongly recommend using a 6 button controller for this game, so if you manage to get through this review and still want to try it, just keep in mind those compatibility issues. Once you're finally brave enough to try out the first real mission, it's time to start Operation Red Witch. You're given a presentation in the ready room where all of the pilots seem to have Val Kilmer's hair from Top Gun, and your commanding officer leads you through the four stages of the level, all of which will be located on your map as waypoints. Also, I hope you like map screens, because there's a very good chance you're going to be spending a lot of time flipping back and forth between the map and gameplay to try to figure out exactly where you're at for when you went slightly off course and overshot your target, or for when you need to get a better look at where you are in proximity to your goals and other enemy combatants. Technically, you do have a waypoint indicator built into your HUD, which is somewhat helpful, but sometimes you really do just need to try to figure out what might be shooting you from where, and the radar isn't always helpful for that, especially when you're taking particularly hot fire. The overall goal for the first mission is pretty straightforward. Take off from your airstrip, fly to two separate SAM sites, destroying them in the process, and then finally take out four buildings that make up the enemy command center in the middle of the local village, ideally while not damaging any other buildings, and then fly back to base. However, just because it's straightforward does not make it easy. Apparently, even though the landing strip is designated as a friendly, enemy aircraft have no problem getting near it, and oftentimes you'll be up against both a helicopter and a jet almost as soon as you get in the air. You can attempt to ignore them and instead head straight for the first SAM site waypoint, but chances are they are not going to ignore you, 
which means you'll want to probably take them out as soon as you can before you get to the Sam hunting. This, unfortunately, is much easier said than done. The in-game graphics, while they look similar to those other combat sims that I mentioned, simply aren't quite as good, which is a problem when you're trying to locate and take down enemies and targets. I'll circle back to the graphics in a minute, but the draw distance in the engine doesn't appear to be as far as what's in those EA titles, meaning that if you can see those airborne enemies, they're at best just going to be a speck on the screen until you get very close. And with the frame rate in the games hovering around just a few frames a second, hunting for those tiny targets isn't the most enjoyable task in the world, especially when they will shoot at you given the chance. At best, you can take out the helicopters, as they're obviously less mobile, but an enemy aircraft may well drag you halfway across the map before you can get it in your sights to take it out, using up precious fuel in the process and probably taking you through other hostile armaments all the while. This is also a problem for trying to track down SAM sites that are actively trying to shoot you down. The target tracking built into your jet's computer tries to be helpful and auto-target the item closest to you, but frequently SAM sites will have plenty of other buildings around them, and it can be difficult to determine what you should actually be shooting at versus just some innocent building. Going back to enemy aircraft, well, all I can say is that hopefully you're the chaser rather than the chasee because trying to circle around on something from behind you in the game is a huge pain, and chances are you'll be bouncing in and out of your map screen numerous times trying to get in better position. Thankfully, your fighter is stocked with a supply of chaff and flares, and the game does a good job of alerting you when you're being fired on. This is where you'll definitely want that six button controller, as the chaff and flares are mapped to the Y and Z button, and otherwise, you will have to keep toggling into the jet function menu to drop them something that you definitely do not want to be doing while you're in the middle of combat. However, the flares and chaff, just like the various missiles that your MiG is armed with, will run out, and when that happens, or that you run on low on fuel, you'll want to head back to your airfield and start again. The game mentions this as a normal part of the game in the manual, in that it expects you to occasionally have to refuel, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, this is a combat sim after all, but with just how hostile the territory appears, you're probably going to be doing this a few times during a mission. The ability to go back to your base airstrip at any point brings up an interesting quirk of the game. To progress to the next mission in the game, you don't actually have to complete the mission that you're on. Score enough points by blowing up targets, and the next time you land, or eject, and you'll pass, and get sent back to the mission selection screen, with the next one now available. I don't necessarily mind this with as difficult as the game is, but it's pretty odd. Usually military success is by, I don't know, successfully completing missions, not just blowing up enough targets. So it's odd to say the least, with the game not even giving you the option to go back up and complete your tasks if your score is high enough. This brings up another issue that I have with the game when it's compared to its peers, and that it's it has a complete lack of any kind of options. It would have been nice if the game had some a, difficulty settings that would allow players to ease into the game. Perhaps maybe not be quite shot at so aggressively, or have the fuel tanks last a bit longer so that players won't have to refuel quite so much. The game does feature an auto land sending so that players don't have to go through the process of lining up an approach each time, and that is nice, making manual landing a point bonus instead, but the overall difficulty of even the first mission is a bit much, and serves to drive players away. Perhaps the developers thought that with the game only having five missions, that maybe if the game was too easy, gamers would just finish the game quickly and move on, but the height and difficulty to make up for length is never a good thing. The graphics don't help matters either. I mentioned earlier that the draw distance isn't as good as what I've seen in other ca combat sims, but beyond that, the game simply isn't as detailed as what was in those games either. You're going to see a lot of vast expanses of dirt and possibly water, and not much else. Just like the enemy vehicles, you won't see buildings on the map until you get very close to them, further hindering navigation. And what you do actually see is incredibly plain. 
I'm not sure if that was a compromise that the developers made to get the game to run the way that it does on the Genesis, but in looking at the DOS and Amiga versions of MiG-29 Fulcrum, it is pretty similar in lack of detail. But seeing as how those versions came out almost three years earlier, in those cases it's a bit more forgivable. And don't get me wrong, I understand that a polygon-based game is not going to run well on the Genesis without help. It's just not what it's designed to do. But it's still not as good as what I was expecting, especially in comparison to its direct competition. Just to not completely crap on the game's presentation, I do like how the HUD and jet controls are displayed. There's a ton of detail there, like the eight warning lights to the right side, the thruster levels, fuel levels, and ammo levels all available at a glance, which is nice, and the cockpit appears the most complete out of any combat sim that I've played so far, for players that are into that sort of thing. The targeting display section that shows what's in your sights isn't quite as detailed as what's in other games, but at least it's there and it is helpful to know exactly what you are locked onto. From a sound perspective, the game actually holds up pretty well. There's not a ton of background music to speak of, but what is here is pretty nice, and makes the title screen and the mission intros about as exciting as a basic status screen can get. Once you get into the game, the game is relatively silent, as you would expect with just the sounds of the jet at first, but then once you get into combat, gun and rocket fire, explosions, and all sorts of alerts start to ring out, giving a nice atmospheric experience. Unfortunately, the audio in this version is just credited to Teartex, so I can't shout out anyone specific for the music, but I do kind of wonder if Marvelous Matt Furness was involved, as he was responsible for the ad-lib soundtrack on the DOS version. I'll be honest, I probably didn't give MiG-29 Fulcrum, or I mean MiG-29 Fighter Pilot, as much time as I gave to certain other games, but in the time that I did play it, I didn't really find anything that really made me want to continue to try playing the game. The second level has you supposedly having to perform an escort mission for a submarine as one of your tasks, and, well, good luck even getting to the point of trying to escort the sub, due to not really being able to see anything until you're right on top of it, and then having to deal with enemy fire just to get to that point. As a result, I'm giving MiG-29 Fighter Pilot one star. The game simply doesn't bring anything to the table noteworthy that wasn't done better in previous combat sim titles, and I would recommend this to only the biggest fans of the genre. And even then, be forewarned, you are probably in for some turbulence. Okay, and that's it for MiG-29 Fighter Pilot on the Genesis. I was honestly disappointed in this game. Not that I was expecting that much, I knew that any kind of polygonal 3D title was going to be a tough sell on this console, especially these days now that we've been spoiled by the amazing graphics of our current gen consoles and computers, but even with those same limitations, I have been impressed by other titles on the console, so I want to at least give it a chance. Hopefully the next time I come back to this genre, I'll be pleasantly surprised again, and I'm just chalking this one up to, well, I mean, they can't all be good. Next time on Zalagamoto, it's just about that time. In a little over two weeks, Super Bowl 58 will take place in Las Vegas, with four teams left currently vying for the title, and coincidentally, I've got a pro football game lined up in the schedule to go along with the action. And I'm already hearing you out there, another football game. You just reviewed Mike Ditka Power Football a few months ago. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't create the Genesis library. It just happens to have a lot of football games. But at least this one I'm pretty sure is probably a good one, as it's the sequel to a game that is currently the seventh best game that I've reviewed so far on the channel. Will this one surpass that? Or is it just an annual rehash that we've gotten used to with sports titles over the last 30 years or so? We shall see. But that's it for Zalagamoto episode 226. If you liked what you saw here and want to see more, please think about liking and subscribing if you are so inclined, as it will help more people see these videos. But most importantly, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!